if you clicked on this video, then maybe you're interested in starting your own restaurant, or you're just curious what it's like to build a kitchen not for your house, but for a giant restaurant or a small restaurant or a food truck or heck, I'm not even sure what else, but if you just wanna build a commercial kitchen, you're here on this video and we're gonna show you how. This is Kyler from HRI. Kyler, what does HRI stand for? HRI stands for Hotel Restaurant Institutional and the last part of our company name is Commercial Food Service. There you go. Kyler, you, what, what do you do there? I'm the general manager of HRI, so I oversee all of our operations, sales, project management, and service. Awesome. So it's fair to say that you've gone through steps with restaurant, restaurateurs and business owners from starting their kitchen design, or starting their restaurant really, mm -hmm. into their restaurant design, all the way through established restaurants that absolutely. maybe need new equipment, equipment repairs, I, upgrades. Uh, absolutely. We're a, we're a full service commercial kitchen equipment dealer. So we've got three tiers to our business. Okay. The first tier is design. So somebody wants to build a new kitchen, somebody has an existing kitchen that they're renovating, or somebody has a kitchen that just they want to make a little bit more efficient. Gotcha. So our company meets with them and goes with them step by step to make their you know dream a reality, right? And then from there, eventually, we can sell the equipment, do the installation ourselves. And then finally, people don't want to hear this, but no matter what level of equipment you buy, whether it's premium or economy, it's going to break down at some point. So we have a service division as well to uh, cool. see it all the way through its life cycle. Wonderful. Now, just so everybody knows, this is not a sponsored video. Kyler did not reach out to me, nor is he paying me for this video. I reached out to him. This is just me wanting to show you what these steps are and how to build a commercial kitchen. And so I went to an expert like Kyler. You may have noticed that we're sitting inside Firestone Stone's kitchen again. You've seen a couple videos done here already. We wanted to start here because Firestone's is a pretty new restaurant opened a little over a year ago. Yeah, about, it'll be two years in May, I believe. Wonderful. And Kyler and HRI did the entire thing in here with the exception of these big giant big green eggs that were custom worked by the owners of the restaurant, right? That's correct. Yeah. So everything else that you see in here down to the ladles. Yep, that's correct. And the maybe the even the 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 linens? Yep. Not the linens, <laughs> but the plates and okay, all that. Okay, the plates too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so everything you see in this restaurant is was procured and helped design with Chef yes, Firestone. Yes, that's, that's correct. And uh, and yeah, so we'll go we'll go through the restaurant and then we're going to go to another brand new place in Erie, Pennsylvania called the Flagship City Food Hall that has not only one restaurant in it but nine restaurants in it and smaller restaurants mind you, but nonetheless nine different restaurants operating totally different types of culinary experiences. Cuisine. Yep, absolutely. So, so a very diverse assembly of kitchens. Kyler, what would you say is the first step to beginning a commercial kitchen design? So the, the first step before you start anything when it comes to designing a kitchen is understanding your menu. You need to know what type of food that you're going to be cooking and selling to your customers. You don't have to have everything nailed down exactly to the nth level degree, even though that's helpful, but you have to understand what kind of cuisine you're going to be cooking, whether it's Italian, Asian, are you going to be slinging pies? You know, what are you going to be making and selling to your customers? Because that will ultimately determine what equipment you're going to need, what kind of footprint you're going to need, and then basically your overall operations and functions. Now, do you have an example of someone who may have thought like, yes, I know I need, I'm going to need this, but turns out, no, that's not what you need. Like say they're going to be slinging pies and they think they need something specific. Like what, what, would, what would one of those in instances be? You know, a lot of the equipment can be very versatile, right? You can cook a lot of different things on a griddle, a charbroiler and, and whatnot. Lots of times customers have a a misconception or maybe underestimate the space and some other functions that they're going to need. One critical part that always goes overlooked when it comes to designing a kitchen, it's one of the key functions, is your storage. Yes, you know you're going to be making burgers, you're going to be putting on a charboiler, you're going to want X, Y, and Z. That's the easy part. But you're going to need your backup refrigeration, your walk-in storage, your freezer storage, and all your dry goods. There's a bunch of different, you know, kind of background miscellaneous type of things that you have to take into account when and, you know, designing a kitchen, right? Those big pieces where what you're cooking on, you're sauteing, that's easy, right? You know, you usually have a background in it. You know, you need certain pieces to succeed, but it's really the background equipment that really allows a restaurant or a chef to be successful. Chef Firestone, you know, he's a, he's a seasoned chef, so he knows the importance of, of all of that. Back here, we can start back here, and you can notice basically 
any place that we had the opportunity to put shelving, wall shelving, or wire rack shelving in this kitchen, it's there. So if you look in the back corners here, there was kind of dead space, we threw shelving in there. Over here, we've got wall shelving peppered all around this facility. And then back here, we've got a nice dry storage area where he's got the majority of all his bulk dry food storage. And you had remarked when we first got here about how clean oh, this yeah. restaurant is. A absolutely, <laughs> and, and um, again, not surprised with, with Martin. Yeah, I mean, you you look around here, the kitchen is, is immaculate. You don't really see grease stains everywhere. Everything appears to be polished, which, you know, is really critical when it comes to maintaining your, your equipment. The vast majority of equipment repairs or upgrade that we need to make or we see with our existing customers it is a result of stuff not being maintained properly, right? They're not doing the standard preventative maintenance on their equipment. They're not cleaning it regularly. And over time, grease builds up. The condensing units become dirty, causing the equipment to work harder. Therefore, down the road, usually causing an ultimately a failure and an emergency repair, which can be even more expensive than even a, a new piece. So it is critical when you have a kitchen to be taking advantage of preventative maintenance services, as well as keeping your equipment clean at all times. Do you go from the cooking devices first after you know the menu, or do you go into like storage? Like yeah. what's, what do you, what's your steps? Yeah, so so really, you know, when you're des designing a kitchen, there's just, there's key functional areas. So right, the first step is understanding your menu. And then you gotta understand what's your footprint gonna be? You know, what, what kind of space are we working with? If you're a full service restaurant that's not doing like outside catering or other things, the standard rule of thumb, and this ebbs and flows, so don't hold my feet to the fire on this, is 60-40. So between you know, 30 to 40% of your footprint should be dedicated to your commercial kitchen. That's inclusive of all your walk-in storage, your cook lines, your prep, etc. And the next 60% is to dining. So once you kind of you know got an idea of you know where's the kitchen gonna be, where's the dining room gonna be, then you can really start digging into the layout, right? So you understand your menu, and then the other key functions that you have to start accounting for are receiving. So when food comes in, where is it going to be coming in? Is it going to be coming in the back door, front door? Is it going to be going straight into a walk-in? Where is that coming in? So that's that's receiving. And then when it comes in, where are you putting it? You got to have your storage area. There's three types of storage. There's low temp, which is freezer storage. There's medium temp, which is refrigerated cooling storage. And then there's dry goods storage. So those, those are two. The other areas is production. So you've got your receiving, you've got your storage area. Where are you going to cook the food? And that really breaks down into two areas. There's the prep area, where if you look around in this kitchen, right, we've got sandwich units, we've got stainless steel tables, all of this can be accounted for prep area, right? And then you really move into the cooking. Again, similar to the storage and whatnot, it's the overlooked areas that are really critical for a kitchen. So you have to have ample prep space. If you have ample prep space, you can pre-cut the foods, do a lot of prep work ahead of time that enables when you're Friday night, Saturday night at seven o'clock when the kitchen's on fire and there's you know 100 guests out there, it's set up so that the chefs and the line cooks can work very efficiently. So you gotta have prep space. And then the other part of the production is the sexy part of the kitchen. It's the fired gas fired wood fired equipment so that's everything that you would see under here so chef's got a neapolitan pizza oven right here which absolutely is a, a machine you can crank out a, a whole pizza in you know 90 seconds to three three minutes depending on the size and you know what what temperature they're firing it off of here you've got pizza oven then you've got your green eggs and then in this back area you know he's got the rest of his production here typically what what would fall under that is you know your ranges your convection ovens smokers griddles planchas fryers anything like that that's really bringing you know cooking the food is what's covered the most expensive part of a commercial kitchen all in is the exhaust system right so you've got these big canopy hoods that you know basically what they do is they suck all the air all the grease and all the smoke and all the smells that's produced by this equipment and pulls it out of the building so that basically pulls everything out of the building so that you know the kitchen's not getting overheated the place doesn't start smelling this part right here everybody's very familiar familiar with the exhaust fans. We're gonna get real nerdy here. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna get real nerdy. You've got exhaust fans pulling all this air out of the facility, right? And you're blowing it out in, into the air. What that does is it, it imbalances the pressure of the building. So it turns into a, a, a negative pressure where it's pulling air out. We need to bring that air back in. So what you can see here, these are called plenums, right? And what they do is they're connected to a unit called a makeup air unit. And what that does is it pushes air back into the building. The air can be conditioned 
condition. So in the summer, it blows cooler air. In the winter, it blows warmer air. It keeps an ambient temperature within the kitchen and it also balances the room. Okay, so you've got your storage, you've got your kitchen layout, you've got your menu first and foremost. What's what's next? Like what's the next part of the whole process? Yeah, so so we're, we're in, I think, three of six uh, of the, the functional areas. So, so we spoke about the receiving, the storage, and the production. The next part is what we'd call service. The chefs, line cooks, they're done here. Typically, most kitchens, you'll find something that's called an expo. So the plate's ready, it's done. They plate the food, they put it on a shelf or out here on a table, ready for pickup. And, and at that point, the servers, when it's ready, will come in and grab it. And it's really critical from a flow standpoint, having your kitchen set up in a way where you don't have a lot of conflicts. Typically, when we design a kitchen, we have two dedicated areas, one coming in and one going out. When you have a single point, that's where collisions happen, food gets dropped, that's where you hear plates banging uh, when your customer's at a, at a restaurant. So that's the service part of it. So you, you've got the expo part of it, you have the food pickup, and then you have the wait staff taking the food out to the customer. And then there's a whole dining aspect to it that really doesn't fall into the commercial kitchen design. You know, we do work with customers to lay out their furniture so that, you know, successful for them and set up in a, a, a great manner. Um, but moving into the, the, fifth, the fifth functional area is when the customer is done with their food, the wait staff grabs it and they bring it to the wear washing area. So this is one of the most critical parts of, of the kitchen. If you do not have a well set up in an ample space set up for dishwashing, you're really gonna create bottlenecks and create an issue within the kitchen. So you're definitely gonna wanna have your, your dishwasher, your dish pit is usually what we call it, in an area that is easy for the waiters to get to, to drop off. And then when you set up a dish area, there's basically three components to it. You have your soiled dish drop off, right? So you drop the, the, the food off, you put the scraps into the waste bin, and then you move it on and you pre-rinse it. And then from there, you put it into the dishwasher. Typically, a restaurant of this size, you would have a, a door-type machine. When you do get into larger kitchens where there are 200, 250 guests or plus, you'll move on to a conveyor dish machine, which basically you put it in and it goes through on racks and conveyors and comes out clean on the other side. Then once you get through the dishwasher, it comes to an area for clean dish. So this is where they come out clean. This is where they get um, you know kind of assembled, dried off, and put back in, ready to be reused again. I mean, it's it's really uh, you know important part. If you don't have a good dishwasher and a good good dish machine, you're kind of really set up for failure because what will happen is you're going to have a massive bottleneck here. You're not going to have enough plates to get out. It's going to create chaos in the kitchen, and ultimately it's going to be you know a bottleneck that um, is going to really constrain your operations. The biggest service areas, machines that probably have the highest failure rate are the dishwashers just because they're used so heavily. Take care of it, you maintain it, otherwise you probably have some issues down the road. So I've, I've only got one functional space left and it's, 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 it's easy. So the last functional space we got is, uh, is waste. You've got trash cans kind of littered all around. Any chance you have a, a spot where you can, you can stick a trash can in, you do. Make sure all that stuff is, is taken care of and disposed properly, otherwise you could be a, you know, have some issues. Now, does the fun part begin? Hey, that is the fun part, Chris. No, no, the, the fun part does does begin. You know, kind of the first part is understanding your menu, and then you've got your footprint. And now you've said, all right, this is going to be the kitchen area. And then that's where, you know, you know, we come in and we start figuring out, you know, where do we start putting this stuff? And we'll put together a preliminary draft saying, all right, this is your menu. You're going to need a griddle. You're going to need a charbroiler. You're going to need X amount of freezer space. And then we start laying it out. Typically, we'll do that in, in AutoCAD or Revit. We'll make a first pass, and we'll get everything covered. And then there are several revisions, right? So we'll put together a first pass, lay everything out as efficient as you know we can with the information we have at the, at the time. And then that's when really the hand-on work with the customer begins because there is more than one way to make an egg and a chef likes his way the best, right? So we work with them hand in hand, understand you know, what their preferences from equipment types are. You know, How big do you want your griddle? Do you want a small, small charbroiler and a big griddle? Do you want them to be even? We start lay, laying it out from there. And then once we have a 
good idea of the floor plan and we feel very good about the equipment layout, the flow of everything. Then we move into the mechanical and the engineering part of the design process. So that's, you know, one, looking at the exhaust hoods. We're saying, okay, we've got X, Y, Z pieces of equipment under the hood. How much heat are they giving off, right? So based off of the, the BTUs and how much heat they're giving off in the sides from left to right, we work with our manufacturers to specify and design a system that can handle the heat load. And then we go through and we look at every single piece of equipment and we take into account their utility or mechanical Im implications. So what requires electric? What electric is it? Does it require three phase, single phase? Does the building have three phase? If it doesn't, all right, we need to make sure we specify equipment that has single phase. You have to take all of those things into account. Otherwise, it's going to you know, make your kitchen less efficient. So plumbing is the other key part. What pieces of equipment require plumbing? Does it need its own dedicated floor drain? You need to take all of that into account and you need to take it all into account early on, you know, before you do your construction, because once those floor drains and electrical outlets are put in, it's very difficult to add things or change things in the future. And it can be very costly. And then the last piece is something we call, you know, special conditions stuff that when we're putting together drawing sets, let's make sure we take that into account. And then once we kind of get all of that laid out, we'll do a final review with the customer and say, you know, are you okay with this? Do you want this? And there's several revisions, right? You, you, you think you think you want something, then you go home, you wake up in the middle of the night, and you're like, oh my God, I forgot this. I want to add this to my menu. And we're used to that. You know, you, we got to be flexible. But one thing I, I will caution when, when hammers start swinging, you want to make sure you've got your floor plan pretty locked in because after that, it can become uh, you know, quite costly to change things in the field. So you wanna make sure upfront, you're really thorough with what you want, how you want things laid out, knowing that some stuff's gonna change, but uh, you don't want too many dramatic changes. Otherwise that can be you know, difficult and create headaches for the customer. I'm gonna walk beside you. Actually, yeah. why don't you walk on this side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we're in the very, a much louder place because yes. Firestones was closed. This is the Flagship City Food Hall in downtown Erie, and you guys did everything yep. here? Uh, yep, <laughs> yep. Every, uh, every stall here, what we did is we did the kitchen design layout and then supplied and installed all the equipment. Countertops and stuff, that's not us. All the equipment that you see in the back, what we did is we did the design work, work for it, laid it out, worked hand in hand, and then ultimately did the the installation and continue to service the equipment as well. So I think this is a great example of like smaller, more confined spaces mm -hmm. that need to be maximized for efficiency and speed and flavor, right? Right, <laughs> I, I mean, absolutely. What's what's very uh, unique about, about the food hall is, is you think of a food court, right? You go to a mall, you go to the names that you know, the Auntie Anne's, the Barrows, those are set up for, you know, quick turn food, but a lot of that stuff's, you know, pre-made, right? You know, you're, they're just really re reheating stuff. Where here, everything's fresh, right? Which obviously takes longer to cook, but we, everything had to be set up in a way. You're coming here for lunch, you need to be in and out in 25, 30 minutes. You know, it was a really unique project also in the sense that, uh, you know, it was a communal shared space too, where we walked through Firestones. He had his own personal, not personal, but own specific dish pit and whatnot. A lot of that stuff here, here is shared. Also, we had to take into account nine different menus, nine different concepts. You know, this is noodle love here. So they're like Asian noodles, Asian cooking, so very great stuff. If you look in the back there, you know, they've got a walk range, right? You don't see a walk range in every commercial kitchen, but this place specifically needed that to execute their menu, right? So like, if you're thinking about the menu, what do you need? So if you think of a place like noodle love, you've got the walk range, right? And then you move down to the right of that, you know, they've got fried food, you've got the fryer, and then they've got two monster pasta cookers that basically cook the noodles at a very high rate so that they can maintain those turns and get the food out quickly. When we first turned those on, it sounded like a jet engine going off. Oh, nice. It's, nice. Like, <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah, it does, so. So if you wanted to go into a food hall, like what would be like some of your, like maybe your top two pieces of advice? When you go into especially like a food hall, we talked about the quick turn. You can't have a can't have a big menu, right? You, you cannot have a big menu. You gotta keep it to probably, you know, five pieces of things that you make really well. You can prep for it and then you can turn them around really quick. Think about that, you know, narrow down your menu so that you can really crank stuff out. And then also think about, you know, what kind of equipment you can put in 
to make you more efficient. You know, technology has come a very long way to automate processes. If you look at Joe's Bagel over here, there's something called the Rapid Cook Oven. You can pre-program recipes into that. You don't need a griddle, you don't need anything. It'll do three different types of cooking. It does um, convection cooking, it does impingement, and microwave, all three in one piece of equipment. So you're able to crank out stuff at a very high rate, basically make it dummy proof so people like me could even do it, right? You don't need someone with 15 years of experience. You can get people that are new to the industry in and they can make a really high quality product. So that's one thing I would stress to everybody is, you know, your menu, you know, make, make it simple if you're like in a food hall or something like this, and then this is to, to everybody is be very, very selective and strategic and take advantage of the technology out there to ultimately make your business more efficient and ultimately successful as well. What would be your top pieces of advice for someone who's just gonna start out their restaurant, no matter what size it's going to be? Uh, I know you talked about the menu, but like other things that maybe people don't really ever think about. Where you have the opportunity to, give your staff some space. So if you can give them instead of three feet, which is minimum from a code, from a passing standpoint, try to do four, because that's just gonna open it up and I guarantee you, your staff's gonna thank you for that one. Since I'm here in the bar area, just specifically with bar, one thing that I will recommend if you're a high volume bar, get an undercount bar dishwasher because you can crank those bad boys out in 60 seconds you know keep the beer flowing which will be good for the customers and you we've talked about pretty much everything but what about budget everybody's like hmm incredibly important right because you might want the hot Taj Mahal of a kitchen but probably can't afford it to a, to a degree so you have to be very selective in mm -hmm. in what you purchase, right? You have different tiers of equipment, right? You have the highest premium, you've got the middle tier, and you've got the more economy tier. You know, within those, you know, there's brands that are very strong, right? You probably can get away with some things down more in the economy brands, cost-effective okay. brands. Um, but yeah, budgets, a, it's an incredibly important aspect, and yeah. that's why it's important to, you know, seek out professionals. They can put together budgets for free, estimates for you for free, give you an idea, and you can always work down, right? understand where what you're able to afford at this time you know work with whoever your consultant is and they can help you get in there and ultimately get gotcha. you open so maybe plan for upgrades absolutely great. that's great so plan for upgrades I, I think not a lot of people realize this but when you go to a restaurant and you order a chicken sandwich or you order a pizza or you order a ribeye steak the things we talked about today are all factored into the pricing of those so yep. would you say that when they're designing their menu which is the very first part of designing your kitchen yep. to factor in how expensive do you want your meals to be absolutely absolutely whether they know it or not they're buying your equipment too yeah, <laughs> and, absolutely and they're paying for your insurance and, and your lights paying, yeah and your lights they're paying for everything whether they know it or I'm sure they know it, but they just don't want to admit it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but factor that into what you can afford. Also from a budget standpoint, I said this earlier, take care of your equipment. Service is when customers don't take care of the equipment, they let things build up on it. That's when you need to replace it or have emergency services. Maybe that's a whole nother series of videos. If you guys like this stuff, yeah. and you want us to do a series of videos on maintaining your pizza oven or <laughs> maintaining Absolutely. your broiler, or whatever, whatever the piece of equipment is, you know, tell us in the comments if you'd like to see that kind of stuff. Even if you don't own a restaurant, and you're like, hmm, I'm just interested. Yeah. You know, and what how, what it takes to maintain a restaurant. Uh, let us know in the comments. And uh, yeah, well, thank you, Kyler. No, thank you. I this appreciate it. Was wonderful. It was I fun. learned a ton. I'm not going to start a restaurant <laughs> anytime soon. But I appreciate you. Thanks for watching. No, cool. Thank That's you. It.